Hey robot makers, hope you're having a good day so far. So do you want to design and build your own robot but don't know where to start? Not sure which processor or motor, how to power it um, or how to write the code for it? Then this is the show for you. So let's dive straight in. My name's Kevin, come with, me, come with me as we build robots, bring them to life with code and have a whole load of fun along the way. Okay, let's get over to our keynote and uh, make a start on this. So yes, this is all about um, how to design and make your own robot. So we're going to have a look at um, looking at purposes. You know, what do you want to achieve with your particular robot? Uh, we're going to have some tips, things to consider. We're going to look at power, processors, moving things around, sensors, remote connectivity, and of course, 3D design as well. And if you're watching this live, we'll also have a bit of a live Q&A and um, a bit of a chat after the show. Okay. So the first thing you need to do when you're thinking about building your robot is, is have a reason for doing this. What is it you are trying to achieve? So what size and features do you want your robot to have? What environment will it work in? So is this going to be an indoor robot, an outdoor robot? Is it for your garden? Is it to wear on your shoulder, for example? Hey, Jav Javon. Um, uh, is it for um, remotely controlled or is it autonomous? So is it going to run under its own power with making its own decisions or are you going to remotely control it with a, a remote control? And um, what are the design decisions you need to consider? You know, is there a weight or height that you need to consider? Is Where is it going to operate inside the house? So it needs to be able to sort of like a vacuum cleaner go underneath particular things or, uh, or is that not a consideration at all? And how many hours do you need to operate this for? So that will also govern... Um, the size of the battery or the power requirements for it and are there any other safety features that need to be considered as well so if this was a commercial robot working in a factory for example it might need to be able to detect people um, I saw a completely autonomous factory uh, with one of the companies I work with and uh, it was quite impressive seeing these massive robots they call them AGVs uh, and they sort of roam around this factory picking up pallets it's like a forklift truck without a driver but when they whiz around they can really go at some speed and if you stand in front of it apparently it's supposed to stop but I would not like to try that so there's some of the things that you need to consider so what I do when I'm designing my robots I have a, a book and I will scribble down ideas um, I'm not sure if I've got any in this particular book um, well maybe I have actually let me show you so if I'm designing a robot I shall scribble down some ideas and I will think about all the different things that this robot needs to have. And it's pretty much that list that we've uh, just considered there. So once you've got that in mind, you then need to, like I've got there on there, think about making a sketch of this. It really helps bring the, the idea to life. It helps you really crystallize some of the, the challenges that you might face with it. And also it helps you understand how things will fit together. So, you know, if you've got like a range find at the front and a battery at the back, you might consider like, you know, what's the weight and the balance like, where the wheel's going to go, how, you know, what does it look like aesthetically? Um, not all robots have to have a purpose. Some of them can just be for art, for art, um, for aesthetic purposes, if you like. So, um, you know, what's the thing going to look like? And this is where you can really freeform without really committing to anything, design what it looks like. So the overall look... Um, can be decided there and the size and the layout options can be tried out while it's still very easy to change as soon as you start 3d printing things and start screwing things together and buying electronic components and all that that's when things get real and things start costing money at this point you know it's just costing a piece of paper and a bit of bit of lead from your pencil so this is one of my favorite stages just sketching things out and a lot of the ideas i have probably don't make it to fruition but um, it's just good to sort of sketch these out. It's also really quite satisfying. So that one you can just see on the screen there. You can see this robot that this eventually became. You can see even like the, uh, the, the sort of froggy sort of look at its face, uh, the way that the motors um, are underneath there. Uh, that one pretty much was bang on, even though that was a simple sketch. So robotics is the intersection of three different disciplines. So you've got mechanical engineering, you've got all the physicality, how things are going to physically fit together. Some people are really naturally gifted when it comes to this and things like mechanisms. Um, they can just they just get it. They just understand it natively. Um, electrical engineering is all the electronics, wiring things together, um, all the sensors and really low level stuff where it's um, you know a mixture of a physical device and also an electronic device that sort of sits in that sphere. And then we've got pure software engineering where you write the code to bring the robot to life so where all those three things overlap you have robotics i've tried to have a a, a go at filling in what sits in between the various different disciplines but uh, to be honest that's just a bit of guesswork so between mechanical engineering and software engineering they don't really 
fit together well as in this Venn diagram area. So I've sort of said 3D design probably sits there. So when you're thinking about 3D design is something you're using software to bring a design to life in 3D. And where software engineering and electrical engineering fit together, that's where you have like control systems and control theory. Where we have mechanical engineering and um, electrical engineering um, that can be called mechatronics although mechatronics can encompass all of robotics as well so it's the kind of interplay between those two different things and i think it's just important to understand that you might have strengths in one of these areas and weaknesses or areas to develop in other areas uh, and just accept that and just understand that they're the areas where you can sort of um, improve upon later so for me mechanical engineering is one of the areas uh, i need to sort of develop in other things to consider, smaller robots are easier to make. One of the reasons I have so many of these small robots, sort of desktop hand-sized robots, is because they're very quick to build. Um, you can print out a 3D printable robot, you know, in an afternoon. Um, so they're very easy to put together and iterate upon. If you create an absolutely gigantic robot like this, uh, what's that called, a gun Gundam? It's Gundam, it's a... Japanese sort of manga style robot, but they, they have a, quite a few of these that are absolutely the size of a skyscraper. They're absolutely huge. So yes, if you want to build robots, I would say start small because it's much easier to, uh, to develop and to learn with one of those. They also have a low center of gravity. If you have a robot that's very tall, you're then going to have to deal with the fact that this thing's going to sort of sway around and be a bit unstable. So you might need to consider that. Um, a lot of the time, robots will have the battery right in the middle of the uh, the robot's center of gravity, and that just helps it become more stable uh, and easier to control. Another thing to consider is that wheels are easier con to control than feet. If you are making a robot that has some kind of feet, like a spider, a hex robot, that kind of thing, um, they are much more trickier to, to, to develop as a, as a learner because you have to consider about the very fact that as this robot leg swings round, You've got um, the fact that there's going to be some sort of centrifugal force. There's going to be forces that you have to deal with in your code. And you might need to have a sensor that can detect that as well. So like an IMU that can detect what orientation your robot is in, uh, given its walking cycle. You could just ignore all that and just hope that it works. Uh, and that's what a lot of very basic robots do. They'll just have a, a walking cycle and they will fall over um, if, if, if it just so happens to be on a different terrain. Wheels are much easier to control than feet is the is the tip there. Tracks are more forgiving on um, more tr challenging terrain, shall we say, than uh, wheels. Wheels can get stuck. So I've got quite a few different types of robot on my desk here. If I just grab one of these. Um, this one, the Smiles robots have this really nice track. These are all 3D printable as well, which is quite neat. And if I sort of let you zoom in just there, you can see there's these little white pins that are holding the track together. And that's just 3D printed filament just sliced up into little pieces. So I really cleverly engineered that. And these are very, very um, uh, forgiving of any terrain. So they can go over all kinds of stuff, you know, particularly carpet and stuff, but also outside. Um, so yeah, tracks are more forgiving um, than wheels. And if you really are a beginning, you might want to consider getting a starter kit. So I've got a couple of starter kits just to show you here. So the first one um, is from Kitronics, and this is called the Move. I think they have a Move version 2 now. You can just see it says Move there. This is the original one. And this one is actually for the uh, the BBC Microbit. So the Microbit will just uh, plop in there. I think I've... Uh, yeah, you basically have to unscrew this, like there's five little screws there. You unscrew that, put that in, and uh, then it's ready to go. And it's got its battery pack in there. It has a servo for lowering and raising this uh, little scoop thing at the front. And it's simply just got two wheels, and it sort of balances. Because the wheels are so close to the ground there, it doesn't need like a, a caster wheel or anything like that. So it's quite a simple robot, um, made out of uh, um, acrylic layers so quite easy to construct and it's just made using screws so it's quite a nice kit that you can get there there's another one that we looked at a couple of weeks ago which is the uh the cute bot so this cute bot here um from uh, electrics this one has a very similar kind of um uh, board to the bbc microbit in fact if i grab the bbc microbit there it's got the exact same pinouts uh, as as the uh, microbit so that one um, is quite a nice robot. Let me just put that the right way around. And it has a, a bunch of different things on it. So it's got the uh, the range finder. It has uh, two sort of headlights, but it also has a, a line following uh, sensor. It's got two of them there, so it can follow a line along the floor. Uh, and it's it runs MicroPython as well, this one, so it's quite straightforward. 
the, the microbit one also can run uh, MicroPython as well. If uh, MicroPython does run for that. Now there are some other types of board that you might want to consider. Now, this is another Kitronics one actually. Uh, so this one um, has got the, I think it goes that way around. It's got the connector there for the micro bit and it's got all these different breakouts there as well for motors and for power. So the power can go in there and then you've got motor A and motor B and you've got all these other uh, connectors on there as well. So what do they actually say there? You've got, sorry, motor A, motor B, you've got input one, input two, and then you've got buttons. So sorry, they're, they're buttons, not uh, motors. But yeah, that means that you can build a robot around this. Um, I have got another robot just here. Let's see if I can get this without it falling to pieces. Which has another Kitronics board on it. This one is up for, again, uh, another BBC micro, uh, BBC micro bit. And this one is a quad walking robot. So this one has four legs and each leg has um, two servos, one for moving it that way and one for moving it up and down. And the micro bit can sort of just sit in there and we can power that by um, a LiPo battery as well. Because the micro bit has that really nice GST PH connector on it. Get that to focus on there, which means we can plug in all kinds of power packs to there as well. So if you're starting out, you might want to consider with a kit to begin with, get an idea of how robots work and then sort of move on to building your own. Okay. So next up is power. Now I'm going to do an episode specifically on power um, in next year. Uh, it's one of the most requested uh, shows, I think, from quite a few people um, because it's one of the challenging things with power. First of all, how would you figure out how much power you need? If you have a battery that's one voltage and you have a board that requires another voltage, how would you do that kind of conversion? What, what kind of boards will help you do that conversion? And also, how long will these... Uh, um, batteries last for as well so one of the things you need to consider when you're building your own robot is how long do you need the robot to operate for so for example a robot vacuum cleaner we have one uh, just down here it's called a dbot i think and uh, this one can operate for maybe half an hour before it needs to go and recharge and it's only operating in this sort of three by four meter room um, so it can do quite a lot of uh, cycles within it basically just as like a random walk and then goes back to its little dock and then it'll wake up at another period of time and do the exact same thing as well but again a random walk so hopefully over time you vacuum your whole floor so you need to consider how long does your robot need to work for how much power does your robot need now you have to get out your calculator your pencil and work this out because each robot is completely different so what you'll need to look at is the voltages and um, the output of the battery so this little robot I've got just on the screen at the moment is a really really tiny robot it's um, almost like the size of a matchbox and it's designed around two N20 motors the motors are sort of sat opposite each other like that and then on top of that we have the uh, the motor controller the motor driver board which is an L298N board I think and then on the back of the robot is a tiny uh, RP2040 from Pimeroni, which is the RP2040 Pico type chip. And then there is also one of these tiny little batteries as well to power it. Um, these batteries are actually wired the wrong way around. So when I plug these batteries into like a LiPo charger, the thing started to go very, very hot and there was all magic smoke. So I need to sort of cut those uh, JST connectors off and resolder them with the wires the right way around or basically just tease them out so I can swap them over. So what you need to do then is figure out uh, you know what what voltage does your battery provide. Most LiPos provide between 3.7 and 4.2 um, volts and uh, so 4.2 is like the upper end of it's fully charged 3.7 down to about 3 volts is usually you know flat. Um, so you'll need to take that and then run it through like a book converter or some kind of power boost from, I think Adafruit call them power boost. They have the power boost 500 and 1000, depending what your needs are. So I've used quite a few of those in my robots too. So what, what contributes towards the power draw? Well, these things like the motors themselves, are the motors going to be continually on? Or are they going to be on for a, a short period of time and then stop? That will change the, um, the battery profile. If they use servos, do the servos again need to be on constantly? Are they holding um, a position? So if it's like a, a cat or a dog a robot, if it needs to hold its body sort of in shape, then it's going to take a lot of power to do that. Uh, the sensors actually require power as well. So what kind of sensors are you using and do they need to be, you know, do they need to have quite a lot of power draw? Then the processor. So this is probably 
other than the battery, other than the motors themselves, the process is probably going to, is probably going to draw more power than any other component on the uh, uh, the robot. So you'll need to look at different types of processor and what your needs are. So for example, if we had, um, let me just take a, an example here. Um, one of these feathers, so this is a feather version two, Hazar 32. This will have a different power profile than say um, this blue fruit, which is another Adafruit one circuit playground, than say the Pimroni 2040, motor 2040. This is a, a prototype version, this one, so it's missing big capacity. Is that four, Alex? <laughs> and then uh, what else have we got on here? Um, we've got a couple of other, this is a, a Node MCU, the NESP32S this one is. So again, that will have a slightly different power draw. Probably quite similar, but um, to the uh, Hazard, because they're both uh, ESP32s. But again, it depends what you do with it and how much, if you are using both cores and you're running the cores constantly to do, I don't know, some kind of edge AI, that might require a lot more power draw. So you tend to get on each of these components, there will be a specification that you can download and it will tell you exactly how much um, power this will use, peak, average, and uh, minimum. So you can uh, you can switch things off sometimes intelligently as well to save a bit of power. So that's the processor. And we'll have a look at some of those in a second. If it has sound output or light output, so say it's got um, RGB LEDs, they can take quite a bit of power. They can also get quite warm, which means they're definitely taking quite a lot of power. And finally, if you've got like a wireless or a Bluetooth connectivity or an infrared, again, they will also draw power. So Wi-Fi is particularly heavy on power. Whereas Bluetooth 5.1 or BLE, which is the Bluetooth low energy version, that takes a lot less power. So I've not got the figures in front of me for each of these, but what you need to consider when you're building your robot is each robot has a different power profile and therefore a different uh, requirement for that. Now you can just sort of cheat by having a great big USB you know, power bank and just have slap that on top of the robot or underneath the robot and not have to worry about that too much. I've got some a few different uh, power uh, things behind me some of them are like a uh, 20,000 mah so they can run for probably about a day for one of these little robots but it's very very heavy so processor wise um there are lots of different processor options so we've had a look at a few of those already that i've dropped on the floor and here we have um a few examples of when i took a picture earlier on so we've got the uh the pico lipo on the very left hand side there above that we've got the um arduino i think it's called the rp2040 connect or nano connect that's basically a Raspberry Pi Pico, but on a, an Adafruit um, device. It's got a few extra features there. I think this one had Wi-Fi before the Pico W came out. And it also has a secure chip on it as well for securely storing things on there. Next to that is the really small um, Pico, sorry, the Pimroni 2040, Tiny 2040, which is like a Raspberry Pi Pico sawn in half. It's absolutely tiny. That's what was on that Smars Mini that we looked at a couple of seconds ago. Next to that, we've got um, a couple of ESP um, chips. So there's the ESP, um, I think that one there next to it, the third one along there looks like the Hazar. That's the Adafruit one. Then we've got um, an Arduino Nano there. That's an 8-bit chip. Um, so really, I would say you probably want to go for a 32-bit chip when you're building your robot in general. Um, so the ones that are not 32-bit are this Arduino Nano here and this Arduino Uno. They're ones where they're just an 8-bit chip and you'll reach the ceiling of what's possible with those just because they're um, um, only 8-bit. Everything else I think on here is 32-bit. Um, so then we've got the, the micro bit. We've had a look at that. There's two versions of the micro bit. There's the version 1 and the version 2. I think my version 1 is just on the floor somewhere. The version 2, which I've got here, has also got a microphone and a speaker on it. It can do quite crude um, speech synthesis on there. And it's also got like a touch sensor on the front as well. So that little round thing there is actually a touch sensor. So yes, ESP32, ESP8266, they're all 32 bits. The Arduino, uh, mostly 8 bits, apart from that connect on the, the very first one over here. That's actually a, an RP2040, which is a 32 bit chip. The Raspberry Pi Pico, which is all these ones on the bottom here. And then we have um, the RP2040 embedded boards, such as the Motor 2040. That's what we're going to be using today, which is uh, uh, this kind of chip. So it's got four different headers on there for controlling the motors. And the chip that's just here, 
that's the actual RP2040, so it's a, um, a Raspberry Pi chip. Somebody's asking where all the uh, Pico um, Pico W's are. They're in. They're in my. That's a piece of paper. It fell out of the drawer. It doesn't count. <laughs> So yeah, when I took this picture, I don't think I had any Pico W's hand, but yeah, trust me, there is plenty on here. In fact, there's one just over here, just there. Uh, yeah, there we go. That's the Pico W, you can tell it's got the great big silver chip on it there. Okay, next up, movement. So how are we going to make this robot walk around? So I built all kinds of robots that uh, move around in different ways. So you need to consider how do you want your robot to move around? Wheels and tracks, as we've talked about, are a lot easier to move around than feet, um, but that shouldn't stop you. You should consider at least building one robot that has like a biped robot, like the one in the middle there, which is the uh, Otto DIY. Uh, that's a really fun robot to build, very easy to build, um, and it just requires, I think, is it four servos to make that work? It's got two sort of flappy feet and then uh, two that sort of move it around, so it, it does kind of a a duck waddle but it does walk uh, and it does work quite well and then on the right hand side there we've got the pico cat um, open cat uh, which that's got quite a lot of set, um, um, servos in there you probably need a specialist board like the servo 2040 so this is a specialist board from um, uh, pimroni and you can see there it's got 18 server headers headers on the top there which means it's a uh, much suited for a robot like this that requires quite a few so this one has a uh, it's got at least what's that uh, eight servos um for the for the legs and then it's also got a tail um and it has a head and a neck so there's like a, an additional three there as well so what is that 11 servos in total that's quite a few so i would i would recommend you have a play with this if you can uh, there's lots of different kits out there for doing like um cat type robots uh, dog robots as well um there's the, the nibble um i think that's a commercial kit that's a bit pricey for what it is but you can 3d print the parts out if you have a um, 3d printer as well so if you're going to use wheels what kind of wheels are you are you going to use so I've, I've used a few different types of wheels on my robots i do quite like these moon buggy wheels i don't think this fat size is uh, available anymore uh, but these are really great they've got a nice um, rubbery sort of grip to it so your robot can uh, move around nicely. And then there's also these uh, mechanum wheels, which are really fun. That's what we're going to play with today. So if they sort of turn towards each other, you can make your robot go um, sort of strafe. So if that's the robot there, it can sort of strafe left and right or do any kind of weird uh, movement. So I bought a couple of bought one of each colour from Pimroni. So we've got some nice yellow ones there. We've got some black ones. And the ones that we're going to be playing with today are the green ones. So that's the uh, the wheels. There's lots of different types of wheels that you can get. Um, you can just go for like a 3D printed um, wheel and put like an elastic band on it to make it so that it grips. Uh, that's a nice easy way to, to make a robot wheel grip. If you're going to use legs and limbs, you might want to consider how many degrees of freedom your robot has. So each servo is considered one degree of freedom. So this robot here, for example, um, that's one degree of freedom. Oops, uh, that's another degree of freedom. So you could say this limb has two degrees of freedom. It doesn't have that third degree of freedom, uh, which a lot of things will get. So you can see where they can... Um, if, if you look at one of those uh, spot robots from uh, Boston Dynamics, they have a lot of um, degrees of freedom. So they can really move around. Uh, if you want to make your robot self-balanced, you probably need to have that extra third degree of freedom per limb. Um, and you also need to consider, do you want your robot to have a self-balancing element to it? So the Pico Cat that I built, you can put on there a little IMU that will measure the X, Y and Z coordinates uh, in 3D space. And you can basically decide whether the robot is standing you know, straight, whether it's sort of tilted in any direction. And then you can correct for that with your limbs. That requires quite advanced coding and uh, it's probably not something for beginners, but you can do that. And of course, you can just have the tracks, which is a, you can see that little robot just there on the left hand side is a, a nice SMARS robot. Sensors. So there is a million different types of sensors you can get for your robots. How do you want your robot to sense the world? So does it need simple object detection like a rangefinder? You'll see a lot of the robots that I build have these um, ultrasonic distance sensors because they are really cheap to buy and they're very, very easy to, to use and program. Where's it gone? So I've got one here, for example, which is... Uh, Who's this by? 
Veliman, I think that one is, or Velman. And this one, um, yeah, it looks, like, it looks like a regular rangefinder. They usually have four pins. This one's got five just because. Uh, and they have like a trigger and they have an echo pin as well as a ground and a voltage. So it makes it very easy to code. We can um, we can detect how far something is in front of us. And then we can have a, an algorithm that says if something is within a certain distance, stop, turn, you know, either left or right and then try again, you know, test to see if there's something in front of you. And in that way, you can make your robot detect the, the environment that it's in and avoid obstacles or follow obstacles. If you want this to follow another robot, you can have them all in like a, a line and one at the front can be moving around and the, all of others are keeping within a certain distance. So do you need simple object detection or do you want to have some really advanced, more complex object recognition where it can detect faces or um, smiles or or hand gestures you can do all that kind of stuff with the, with these robots and in fact one of the robots i built um, can do face detection which is this uh, uh, explorer robots so this one's got a lidar on top this one works with ros which is the uh, robot operating system and it has a little camera in the middle there as well so it can detect faces and uh, react to that so you need to consider what kind of object detection or um, recognition do you need for your robot and what other detectors do you need to have on there so do you need a temperature sensor a compass do you need to know like what orientation you're in uh, a distance sensor a 3d orientation so you know the imu uh, is it just colors that you need to detect if you're building a robot that can like solve a rubik's cube you might just need to be able to detect a single color uh, what about a 3d scan so this lidar um, has a laser in the uh, in the front of it and as it spins around it can detect the distance in 360 degrees a couple of times a second to build a real-time map of its environment so there was a video that i did on this uh, quite a while ago so check that one out if you want, want to know more about that um, i think that's called like ros uh, mapping and we'll, we'll do another show on that uh, later in the year uh, next year and what else do we need? So RFID tags. So some people have built robots where you, you essentially have like a card and you can tap it onto a, a sensor, an RFID sensor, and the robot will then do a different piece of code or will act in a different way. Or maybe it uses these as like waypoint markers so that when it goes over a particular RFID tag, it knows where it is. Infrared is another um, way of detecting the environment. So my uh, vacuum cleaner that I have under this uh, desk here that has a an array it's probably about seven different uh, infrared detectors on there and the base station has one infrared detect uh, one infrared um, light on it um, so when it wants to be able to find its home base to go and charge itself it can use that little beacon to detect with its uh, five in they're in like an array in a circle and you know if this one's stronger if this signal is stronger than the, this signal over here it knows to sort of orient itself towards um, the center so that the center one has the strongest signal and then at some point when it gets within a certain distance it'll do a 360 180 degree turn and then reverse into the charge point and get charged up uh, there's Bluetooth beacons as well. Um, you can detect um, a Bluetooth signal and then the signal strength if you know where the beacon is and you've got a map predefined for that. And then finally, things like sound and light levels. So you want to be able to detect, you know, the amount of light in a room or also um, what the sound is like, you know. So is it a voice um, command that you're giving to your robot or is it just sound levels? Is it going towards or moving away from uh, sound or just recording the sound? Okay, remote connectivity. So how do we want to be able to com communicate with our robot? Do we need to be able to remotely control it? Or do we want to be able to communicate with other devices like through MQTT, for example? Um, there are different types of wireless standard that you might be able to use. So Bluetooth, so I understand that the Raspberry Pi um, Pico W, which has got this little chip here, does have the capability to have Bluetooth, but the Bluetooth functionality hasn't been released yet. So I'd keep your eyes open for that uh, next year because um, I've got a strong suspicion that they'll be releasing that at some point next year. And that'll mean that all your Pico robots can then have Bluetooth low energy on there as well. And that'll make things like building remote controls for your Pico based robots really, really something that you'll want to do. Uh, you've got Wi-Fi as well, so Wi-Fi um, is quite a big power draw, so you might want to consider that off uh, Bluetooth. We have uh, RF, so these micro bit, um, yeah, micro bits, they also have a, they've got a little antenna on the side there, and these have uh, an RF um, transmitter on them and an RF receiver, and I think it's, uh, 
wouldn't say what the frequency is there, but I suspect it's like the 433 megahertz range, like the garage door type uh, range. So it's uh, widely um, available worldwide without having to require like a license to operate that. So it's short distances, but they can communicate, you know, data between them, at not a very high bandwidth, but quite reliably. We've also got infrared, ultrasound, and just general sound as well. So you could make your robot speak and have another robot hear that, or you might just want it to sort of tell you commands as it's uh, um, reach an obstacle. It might say, help, move this out the way. Uh, if you go to a Yo Sushi restaurant in the UK, there are a lot of them now have these robots for clearing plates away. So it basically just follows a path around the, uh, the restaurant and it will say, yum, yum, please give me your empty plates. And if you stand in front of this, <laughs> I know this because I've done it, it will say in a very deep male voice, you are in my way, move out the way. For like five minutes. Did it? Yeah. 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 So if there's like a pram in the way, it'll it'll make that as well. So it might just be that you want to output sound um, to the environment, and that's uh, something you might want to consider. Okay, so that's all the uh, remote connectivity and telemetry things you might want to consider. So let's talk about 3D design. So how are you going to construct this robot? So one of the most popular ways of doing this nowadays is with either 3D printing or with um, and, and in, within 3D printing, I'm including like the resin based ones as well as the um, uh, FDM ones and also like laser cutting um, materials, so either acrylic or wood uh, as well. And what kind of software do you want to use to design your robot? So I'm a big fan of Fusion 360. I've been using that a couple of years now. Uh, I am on the professional version of that, but there is a hobbyist licensed version, which is completely free, uh, also for education and students and teachers. Um, so it's worth looking at that if, uh, if, if you want to consider it. One of the reasons I've chosen the F Fusion 360 over other ones is because of its constraint system. And we'll have a look at that um, in a couple of moments time. Um, and it makes you, it means you can draw like a blueprint of what your, you want your robot to look like and then you can extrude out the different parts and uh, it means you can then go back and change the parameters for that size and it will update the entire design based on that one tweak so it's really really powerful and you can also then output the models that you make in that to your 3d printer there's also FreeCAD, which is a really good um, alternative to Fusion 360. There's Tinkercad, uh, which works in a slightly different way than those two, but um, that's quite good for uh, people just getting into this, uh, particularly in education. Blender is also an option if you want to design things in 3D. Um, I would say that requires a bit of skills. I, I spent a couple of years learning Blender. Um, quite a while ago now before I got into the robotics uh, and that requires it's quite a quirky uh, thing to work in 3D. It's not um, intuitive, I would say. So, uh, but you can use Blender for that. And then there are SolidWorks and there's also Onshape. I think Onshape comes with a lot of 3D printers as well for free. So you might want to consider that too. And that little robot we've got there, that's the uh, Smiles Mini that I designed, which is a really tiny robot. So one of the things I wanted to share with you then is that you can design once and use it many different ways. So one of the things I designed is this, this chassis. I should call it something like the Omni chassis. Um, and it's a really simple shape, but it means we can build all kinds of robots just using this similar, uh, this single chassis. Um, so I built three different robots. I've got them all here. I built the um, the Rover robot, which is this one here. So this is the Rover robot. So you can see it's got the same chassis there. We have the Explorer robot, which is this one here. Again, it's got the same chassis underneath that everything is built on, but has a completely different purpose and different feature set, different processor. This has a Raspberry Pi Zero uh, on board, for example, as well as all the laser range finding stuff. And we've also got the Sonic robot, which I built. It's not quite finished yet, but this one's a work in progress. So this is the Sonic one. Again, it's got the same chassis. And this one has the ultrasonic range finder on the, on the front that uh, can spin around and detect its environment that way. And this one's powered by a Raspberry Pi Pico as well. Also has a little screen on the back so you can see the radar in operation. So we're going to build this uh, robot in a, in a moment or two. So let's have a look at uh, these three different robots and see how they differ. So the first one, Rover, so the purpose of this was it was to design uh, a mechanum based robot with some mechanum wheels and just learn how to program on that. So everything else was really just a, a nice to have. It was really just the motors, the wheels and the um, 
the Pimroni Motor 2040 to drive everything. That's really why I built this robot. So you can see there, yeah, the processor has got a Raspberry Pi RP2040. That's the little chip that's just in the middle here. It had the motor driver itself is um, this board, so it's all on one. Sometimes you can have the processor separate from the the driver board. In this case, it's all on one board. The battery is the Gallium battery. Just seeing if I've got any of those to hand, which is the um, the little battery from Pimroni, which is a 400 mAh battery. I don't think I've got any of those to hand. And um, we also have a power board, which is the Lipo, the Lipo Amigo Pro. So in fact, I have got one of those Gallium batteries. It's plugged in, plugged into here. So I just slide this out. Which way is best that way? I can show you what this looks like. So there's a tiny little battery. That's the Gallium battery just there. Let's go full screen for this so you can see this. So the Gallium battery is just there. There we go, Gallium. And it says on there 400 mAh, 3.75 volts. And it's got a nice hard case to it so it could take a bit of a bashing. And that can basically just go underneath the, uh, the main board just like so. Okay. And then what I've also got on here, we'll just have a look at that, is the LiPo Amigo Pro. So that's there. If I just press the power button on there, you'll see all the wheels sort of spring to life. There we go. Uh, and that essentially connects between the battery and the uh, the main board. You can see these two wires that are soldered on that just provide the, uh, the main board with power. Okay. Uh, what else we've we got? So the, the motors themselves are the... Um, Let's see if I've got one of those to hand. Yes, I have. There we go. Just show you that. So this has got a mechanism wheel on it. And these are the, uh, we'll have a look at these in a bit more detail in a second, but these are the Pimeroni um, MMME uh, motors. So it's like micro metal, micro metal uh, motor encoder. So it's got an encoder wheel on the back, uh, which means that it can detect how many times round the wheel has spun and it can give that information back to the robot. So it will know whether the robot is actually doing what it expects it to do, you know, has it turned the right number of times and so on. Um, so that's, it's got four of those. I think they're between 50 and 150 RPM. It has a ultrasonic range find on the front. So this means it can detect things in front of it. I've actually not got this uh, connected up because again, the real purpose of this was just to have fun with the uh, mechanism wheels. And the chassis is the single piece um, chassis that we've looked at the omni chassis which i'm now going to call that that we've looked at earlier so that's the rover robot explorer next so explorer is a lidar lidar robot for use with ROS. that's why i specifically designed this to to house this uh, lidar unit that i bought i think this is about 80 80 90 pounds and it's essentially a single um laser time of flight sensor but that can spin round and it can spin round many times per second. And um, this means that uh, it can detect its environment in three, in, in a kind of slice, not really 3D, kind of a 2D slice, but it can detect walls and so on and feed that back. And if you're using something like ROS, you can then build that into a map. I think there's like a hector slam thing, which enables you to sort of build up in real time a map and it will, it will know where the walls are and kind of remember that they're there. And then as it moves around the robot, it can then understand where it is in its in its 3D space. So this has the um, Raspberry Pi Zero. So there's kind of like a, a stack of uh, different cards there. If you look, you can see just if I hold this up, you can see there there's some little standoffs and then there's the, that's just the, the ribbon that's going to the camera there. So we've got the Raspberry Pi Zero. I think that's a Zero W as well. And then we have the Explore hat, which is a Pimroni um, hat for connecting up motors. And I think some of these wires need a bit of resoldering on here. I can see ones come off there, but um, yeah, the, essentially they just the motors are just connected up as a pair. Each side is a pair, and then they can then connect up into the uh, the Explorer hat to be controlled. And it does have the rangefinder as well as a camera as well, so it can detect objects and feed that back into ROS. Okay, so that's um, what else have we got on there. So the LiPo Pro for converting the power again. I love these LiPo Pro, Amigo LiPo Pros. So there's an example of one of those. So it has two connectors on there, GST uh, PH connectors, and it means that you can connect up a battery. Uh, in fact, are they ZH or are they PH? No, they're PH. 
Um, so yeah, you can connect up a device as well as the battery and then you can charge it with like a USB-C thing there and you can just sort of simply turn it on and off with this, this button here as well. So if you've got your, your LiPo battery like this one, we can plug this in. I caught it, I didn't drop it. We can plug this in to here. There we go, and the little lights come on and we can turn on and off just by pressing this button here, like so. And therefore we're using power from this battery. Okay, let's turn it off. So that means we can charge the battery or we can just draw power from the battery from that single board. So we've got four N20 150 RPM motors. They're the nice little motors that we've just looked at, um, like these ones, uh, but they don't have the encoder on there. So they simply just provide forwards or backwards voltage to the wheels. We've got the ultrasonic rangefinder in the camera and the single piece 3D printed plate, the Omni chassis <laughs> as well. So that's the uh, Explorer. And then we finally have Sonic, which is the, the latest robot that I built, which is this one here. Again, using the Omni chassis. And on these ones, I've actually 3D printed the, the motor holders. So on the other ones, I've got these, um, you can actually buy them from Pimron. Let's go full screen and show you these. So in fact, let's go, let's go on the overhead. It's probably easier to show you this on here. So these ones are um, commercially available. Like they're, all, they're I think they're like injection molded. Um, and what I'm trying to show you is this piece here. So the motor sort of sits in there and then there is two captive nuts. They're quite tricky to see there, but there's two captive nuts. There's one there and one there. And the idea is you sort of sandwich this like so, and then screw the two screws in and your wheel will be held in place. So you can get these ones or you can 3D print your own. Just trying to see where I've left them actually. Here we go. So these are the ones I've 3D printed and they work just as well. Um, you can put the captive nuts underneath and uh, put like a, th I think these are an M3 screw through there and they'll work just as well. So we'll have a look at uh, how to design those in a couple of seconds time. Okay, so that's the uh, the Sonic robot. So this one is a Pico W based robot. It has two L298 drivers on the back, um, which look like these little red things here. So if I just if I just put this into place and then just hold it in place there, you can see that there is two red boards. Each one of them can control two motors each so if we want to be able to control all four motors we need two of them and then there's some header pins which are just going to be connected um, to the pico um, so this also is powered by the gallium battery so there's like a little pocket in here where the gallium battery can sort of slide in there uh, which is nice it means we can replace the battery if we need to um, if we want to sort of quickly swap out another one to charge it or we can use the lipo pro which is just connected underneath here it's probably easier for me to show you this in 3D, but essentially, yes, if I just look at this diagram here, this is where the Pico lives. Um, the um, gallium battery sort of goes in this little pocket here, and then just on, the... I've said that wrong. So the Pico goes on this piece on the bottom here, these little standoffs, and then that's where the LiPo Pro fits on there. Um, so the LiPo Pro converts the battery into the correct voltage for the board like 5 volts and 3.3 volts it's got the four n20 150 rpm motors it's got the rangefinder on the front and the rangefinder has an extra servo motor as well so it's able to sort of spin round and do like a 180 degree sweep of the environment in front of it so that's the um the sonic and of course that uses the omni chassis as well because why would i not reuse that Okay, so let's have a quick look at some of the design decisions I made for the robot, and then we're going to build this this uh, particular robot. This is the Rover. So this was a mechanum wheel robot. That's the why I built this to play with the mechanum wheels. I also built it so that I could play with the uh, the Pimeroni Motor Twenty Forty, and use the MMME motors, which are the um, the ones with encoders on there. So they require six pins. Um, to be able to operate and that's because they can take the readings from the sensor as well as giving it power and um, Telling it exactly how many rotations to make So this is designed for an indoor use only this really won't work outside In fact, it's not really very carpet friendly. It requires like a really flat floor floor and that's because these mechanism wheels um, they, they spin in a very sort of um, 
they haven't got a lot of room to spin round so fluff and things can get trapped in them quite easily so you require quite a tidy clean environment to be able to use these on i think they are also used on um forklift trucks so in like a warehouse and they tend to have a nice flat concrete floors as well so this is indoor use only it's autonomously controlled so it's going to run a program and it's just going to run the program on the the board we're not going to actually remote control it or give it any kind of feedback from the environment it's just going to run um, a standard piece of code and we only need it to run for about an hour and it's really quick to construct as well so one of the reasons i designed this uh, omni chassis was it's a single flat piece it's three millimeters thick so because it's completely completely flat i've just got a little sticker on there to stick on the uh the lipo amigo pro just to hold that in place when i'm uh, using that but other than that it's completely flat as you can see there it's three millimeters thick pretty rigid um, and it means we can just stick everything onto that board and uh, you know we're cooking with gas okay so here's the blueprints for the uh, the chassis i wanted to sort of share this with you just to show you how simple this is so it's essentially a rectangle that's 70 millimeters by 90 millimeters we have some little um tabs if you like which are just for the wheels so they are um there's it's a, a sort of trapezium shape and th the point between that point and that point is five millimeters similar there and there it's eight mil 8.5 millimeters tall and it the top piece there is 16 millimeters so uh, it's it's basically 26 millimeters on the base there and it's anchored at that little corner there i do apply a bit of rounding to these as well a fillet so I think there's like a two millimeter fillet uh, on each corner just to make the thing look a bit more pleasing. Then we have a 21 millimeter wide piece here, which has got a 10 millimeter flat piece and then sort of an arc, which is tangent to that 10 millimeter piece. And then on the back, we have a 12 millimeter deep piece, which has a 48 millimeter um, trapezium piece there. And if you basically just anchor that, um, using fusion 360 it'll work out all the other pieces like uh, you know what angle that needs to be and so on so that's the blueprints for the chassis and then the blueprints for the the motor holder these look a bit complicated but really it's all focused around the size of the nut so if you get some m3 nuts if you make it so that it's 5.45 wide and then it's a hexagonal so all those three interior lines are the same 5.45 and uh, it'll work out what the rest of them is everything else is based around that so we we draw a circle and then we say okay we want the the base of the circle to be two millimeters from the bottom of that point there and then another two millimeters to the top there that will give us our radius of that circle and then we have a 10.5 millimeter drop from the edge of the board so as we look at our board like this we're going to look down uh, 10 millimeters so that top edge there is the is basically that top edge there so it's 16 millimeters wide if you remember from the previous diagram so that defines that point to that point and then we're going to basically have like 12 millimeters so these are two millimeters thick walls for the holder and then we have to say essentially just said four millimeters from that top point to that point there will define the rest you know the whole height of the thing so that's how we define these um have they disappeared too these motor holders and these are really really a great idea because it means you can put a captive nut inside screw it from the other side and they're absolutely locked into place and you can 3d print as many of these as you need to so the other thing to consider with this particular robot is the center of gravity and also um, the center of the robot this means that we can pivot our robot with these mechanism wheels um, very easily because the robot's been designed quite um, symmetrically like that okay you caught that one there alex there's a uh, some spam in the chat there i think yep, okay so if you like what i do and you want to help me uh, grow the channel a bit more um please give this a like drop me a comment in the uh, in the comments below let me know if you're going to build a robot similar to this next year or if you're going to build a completely different robot let me know what you've got in, in mind uh, for next year and also if you've not already subscribed to the channel please do consider subscribing it really does help the algorithms sort of pick up that this is a worthwhile channel and shares it uh, wider with everyone else okay i do go live every single sunday at seven o'clock gmt uh, i think that's 11 o'clock 
PST, I think. Uh, if you're over in the States, that's a quite a popular time zone that keeps coming up where people sort of say, when is this? <laughs> so there you go. So I do go live every single uh, Sunday. Okay, so component-wise, this is all the components we need to build our Rover robot. So I've got four of these Mechanum wheels. You can buy them in different colours. I'm just showing these off at the beginning of the show. There's some nice yellow ones there. I've also got some black ones. And the ones that we're going to be using today are these nice green ones. So I think they're about £24 for a set. Seems quite expensive, but there's a lot of moving parts. Each wheel has uh, a number of uh, rotating parts, and they're quite well made, these, so it's, uh, it's worth it. So we've got four of them. We have one rangefinder, which is, um, I'm just going to use this one here today. I've actually not got these plugged in just yet, but I will use that in future. We have the four standoffs. So standoffs are these little hexagonal barrel things, which means that we can uh, we can rise up the, um, the motor 2040, so it's not sat completely on the chassis. It just gives the robot a bit of a height, a bit of three dimensions as well. We've got the motor holders. We need four of them. We need four N20 motors. Or equivalent, I'm using these um, MMME motors today, which have got the, the connector on there, as, which means it's easier to connect your wires into. And it also means that we can have that feedback um, through the encoders. And we've also got um, the Omni chassis and the control board, which is the the uh, Pimroni Motor 2040. The other things that I've not listed on here is the with the Gallium battery, or I've got a different type of... Uh, LiPo battery here, but this one does have that JST uh, PH connector on there, and also the um, the LiPo Amigo Pro, yeah, the LiPo Amigo Pro, which is the little power board as well. Okay. And the Mechanum wheels, they are available from all good retailers. <laughs> you can also 3D print your own if you really, really want to. So I think on Thingiverse, if that's still going, there's a, a part there you can you can 3D print your own. I really wouldn't recommend you do that, to be honest. I would just say get the, you, you'll regret it if you've, if you've wasted a lot of time trying to 3D print it and they don't work properly. They really need to be quite smooth uh, and not have any, have any sort of artifacts on there. And then the encoders, this is what they look like. So these, you can either buy them as a completely um, pre-soldered kit or you can get the motors that have got the extended shaft on there and you can put the, um, the encoder onto the back, solder two little points and then um, add the whole sensor to the back of it. So these encoders will count the number of revolutions that the um, the shaft makes. So the shaft is different than the um, than the motor's spindle because there's a gearbox on the front there. So it will very very accurately measure the number of times that the the shaft has spun round. So therefore we can we can actually count how many times our wheel has spun round. And that means we've got that ultra precise positioning of our robot. So we can say, turn the wheels round precisely this number of times and then turn back precisely that same number. We can then check to see, did they rotate that number of times and correct for that um, or not. So the encoders are connected to the end of these N20s, provide feedback to the, motor, the microcontroller. And that gearing means that the encoder can rotate a number of times um, that can rotate more times than the spindle itself. And these gears are 50 to one, meaning that the, the ratio between the encoder and the actual shaft is, is that 50 times per rotation of the wheel. Okay, and here's a bit of an animation to, just to show you. I did this one uh, quite a while ago, uh, but I thought I'd just show you again on there. This is how encoders work. So you've got that little wheel. It's got um, some kind of, on this one, I've got a hole. You can have ones which are uh, infrared based and they've got like a, a light sensor and a light uh, detector or you can have ones which just use like the hall effect um, or you know, essentially a couple of magnets and um, some sensors to detect that magnetic field changing. Um, so the encoder wheel will detect those changes and therefore it can count how many times in which direction. It usually has more than one hole so it can detect the direction that these things have uh, traveled in. Okay and then the, the other thing is you can um, yeah you can strafe with these wheels you can go sideways which that's a, a really nice feature of these uh, these wheels that's really why you want to play with them so they're fitted in a particular orientation so we'll have a look at what that is so when you and I need to make sure I do this as well you'll see that the the, the wheels have like an orientation so that they have like a diagonal 45 degree spindle and we need to make sure that the spindles all point towards the center of the robot otherwise the mechanism uh, mechanism won't work properly 
Okay, it's time to build our robot. I'm really excited, right? <laughs> this is where I drop loads of stuff and we, we, we have a half-built robot. So let me get over to our overhead and let's see if we can uh, we can do this. So I'm going to start out with the uh, the 3D printed. You can see there's a bit of uh, matter there from the 3D print bed. And um, I've also encoded, I've included on this one a couple of extra holes. So these are the mountain holes. These four holes are for the, um, the uh, where's it gone? The motor 2040 board which is just sat here actually and um, this is where the the front of the robot's face is going to go so that's the uh, the rangefinder holder and we simply just push the rangefinder into place there and i've designed these to be friction fit so they can just push in and they're not going to fall out they're just going to be nicely pushed together there okay so the next thing i need to do is put these little now which ones do i need to do first let me just think let's try this first so i'm going to put the these little screws into the back and i just need to find my screwdriver wherever i put that there it is and and then i'm just going to screw four of these in and they're going to connect to the the standoffs so i think these are m2 screws i think so these little standoffs are these like little barrel things. I'll show you that. And essentially what we just do is just screw the barrel into place like so. And that's just going to give us a bit of like a, a raised area where we can plug the um, um, motor 2040 into. Okay, so I just need to do three more of these. I'll just do these as quickly as I can. This is a live build, so anything could happen. <laughs> but luckily, it's quite a, safe, a straightforward robot to build this one. There isn't a lot that can go wrong, really. So I'm going to just uh, screw that in. And 3D printed plastic is okay to screw and unscrew a couple of times, but you, you'll find after a while that the, the plastic becomes soft as you've sort of chewed through all the material, and you probably need to print out another, another chassis. You can put super glue into the thing as you're screwing it if you really want that thing to stay in place uh, but super glue is pretty strong i've actually super glued screw threads into place tried to unscrew them and ended up t tearing the screw in, in half actually so the last one here okay so this is the last uh, screw for the standoffs let's just screw that into place there and then we can turn this over and we can screw these two last standoffs in place. They only need a couple of finger tight screws and then there we go. Now obviously I designed this so that the, the screw holes are exactly where they need to be. So you can see there that they, the, screws, the screws align perfectly where they need to be. So I can just very quickly screw these in place. Let me just grab the screwdriver easier to do that if I'm holding it like so okay and let's just find the other screws I'll just do two screws just for the speed there we go As you can see that the robot sort of taking shape now so we've got these uh, four connectors there. They've got six pins um, uh, on each of them. And we have these special connector wires. Um, so these are like JST connectors. And we'll be able to connect all our, our different motors up in a second. So the next thing that we need to do is get our motors. So I've already put the, uh, the captive screws into place there. You can probably see them just in there. And these, mo th there is actually like slight indentations on here. So the idea is we put it so the uh, the motor is like this and then when I push these through let's do these on the back the connector sort of presents itself through that little hole there and we can just use these long screws to screw from the top and they'll screw into the, uh, the captive nuts and hold the uh, the whole thing in place so let me just make sure I've got that right Trying to do this show you it at the same time as uh, aligning it myself there we go and then let's get another one they're a bit fiddly to do these ones i think that's it okay 
So there we go. So that's the first one in place there. Now we just need to do the other three. I'll try and do these as quickly as I can. Now I've actually got two different types of uh, connector here. These are the left ones and these are the top ones. And you can see there that the orientation of the connector is slightly different. Uh, unfortunately, you can't put them in that orientation. The motors are, are not designed. They're not um, completely rounded, if you like. The the um, the height and the width are a different dimension is what I'm trying to say there. So we will use a different technique for the ones at the front. Okay, so let's just put this one into place. That's that one there. Okay, let's screw this into place. You have to entertain people, Alex, while I'm uh, doing this. <laughs> okay, and then the last one for this particular one there. You can sort of feel it grab hold of the, the nut. And I'm not doing these too tight, I'm just doing them so I can feel it uh, grip. If I screwed too tightly, it would just crunch the plastic because uh, there's, I think there's like 50% infill inside of these. Right, so the next ones, what I'm gonna do now, I'm gonna start connecting up the wires because I need to put the wire through the hole because these ones, when they're in place, um, you can see there that the that little connector thing isn't presenting itself through the hole, it's sort of being hidden. So I'm actually gonna have it in this orientation. So that these face forwards, like so, and then the cable's gonna go through that little gap just there. So that's what these are for. These are sort of to hold the, the wires in place. And what I want to do is use this other robot as a guide to see what size of cable do I need. I've got two types of cable. I have a short cable and I have a long cable. So depending on where the uh, the motor is so let's just plug that one in they simply just push in like that really nice and simple that's them connected up now let me do the next two so the back ones are the short cables so let's just uh, plug that the right way around like so and then that one goes into there as well the correct way around that was the correct way around. Why is that not going in? Like USB cables. You try it one way, it doesn't work. You try it the other way, and that doesn't work either. And then you try it the original way, and it goes back in. What's going on there? So, so it's that way around. Okay. It really didn't want to go in there, did it? Okay, and then these other two, I'll connect them up now. So this one is going to the left-hand side. So C is going to the left-hand, the that one there. So I'm just going to shove that through that hole. We'll pull it back as and when we need, and I'll do the same with the last one as well. So that's going to go like so and then I'm also just going to shove that through that hole there as well okay now they don't need to be that far through to be fair they probably only need to be about that that kind of distance like so okay so let's get that one in the right orientation Uh, how did I do this last time? I think that's the wrong way around. That looks better. Yep, there we go. Right, so just need two more screws for this one. And then we're very nearly done then. They're quite a quick robot to put together these. Once you've 3D printed the parts and you've got all the other bits and pieces to hand. I mean, what's this taking me? About five minutes. Like so. And the real test will be when I, when I turn the power on, will it actually fire up and do what it needs to do? Okay, that's nearly there. It's not quite grabbing hold either, with the nuts slightly come out there. really small screws these so they're a bit fiddly to do but there we go I've got it now 
and then we've got the last one to do I said I've done it and then I've not done it there we go let's get that aligned it's always one that proves a bit more difficult than the rest right that's good enough for now and then the last one let's just put that in place there make sure our cable is going through it's all fingers and thumbs at the moment this piece and then it'll all come together in a second so just bear with me I'm sure this is fascinating to watch okay there we go last couple of screws I wish you could see all the comments streaming I need to get a new a no, another monitor up here Alex I think so I can see what people are seeing hmm yeah We've got a spare one upstairs, I think. Right, okay, the last one going in. It's not quite there, that one. I just back that off. They're ever so slightly out, these ones, I think. So they're at a slight angle when you screw them in. I just want it to be strong enough. There we go, it's not perfect, but that'll do. So then we just need to connect up these... Uh, these wires and the connectors like so push that one back through doesn't need to be that far through and then we're ready to play okay right and there's the other two screws for the for the top so that's the robot constructed what I need to do now is just plug the the battery into the uh, the lipo connector this is the lipo 20 of the um, lipo amigo pro so the battery goes into that one there we can see it's got power because the lights come on so i'm going to turn that off i'm going to slide this underneath the standoffs it just happens to be the exact same height and then i'm going to plug the um the robot device into there there we go that's working right i'm going to connect that up and then let's move some robots out the way for a bit of a demo now i know there's an issue with this before i even start um, the issue is that two of the motors are a different speed than the other two so it won't work perfectly but we've got the other one which we can run just to see how it should actually work with all these bits out of the way okay so if I press power it will spin round now did I get the wheels in the right orientation I don't know if I did Let's just have a quick check of that. So, yes, yeah, so you can see these two are actually facing in the wrong orientation. That should be facing in. So this wheel and that wheel need to be swapped. The easiest way to do that is to pull these off. They're a really tight fit. Let's just do that and swap them over. Yeah, now when I was pushing these on before, they're like a really tight fit on a few of them. It's not a bad thing. There we go. Right, so now that's better orientation. There we go, so it's spinning around better. Some of the wheels are spinning around faster than the others, which is why it's not doing exactly what it should do. So let's just pause that a second. And I've got my other one, which has the correct wheels and the correct motors and everything's good to go. So if we run the code here, this is what it should do. Oops, it goes backwards. It can spin on the spot. It can spin back on the spot and then it can go sideways. Look at that. And then there we go. And it's doing that autonomously because it's completely self-powered. The battery is underneath there. We've got the LiPo Mego Pro there. We've got the Motor 2040 controlling all the wheels. And these encoders are telling exactly how many times each wheel is spinning round. And like I said, the only problem I've got on here is I didn't have the exact same uh, speed of wheel so some of these are 150 some of these are 50 I think and that means that the wheels are not exactly this the, the motors are not exactly the right speed so there we go we've built a robot very quickly based on that Omni uh, chassis and we've gone through why we've built what we built all the different design decisions included and we've 3d printed all the different parts as well including these uh, these motor holders as well so the only parts we needed to bring along with the electronics and most of the electronics, if not all the electronics, I think are available from Pimroni. So 
um, when they have stock of all the different parts you can build one of those too so i think i've got a slide that tells you a bit more information about the uh, rover robot just in case you want to build your own which is this one here. So if you go to kevsrobots.com slash rover, you can download the 3D printable files, the Omni chassis, the motor holders, as well as the rangefinder holder at the front. And you can get a list of the bill of materials as well for all the different parts that you would need with, with the links to the, the parts themselves, I think, as well. There's also a Mechanum Robot video that I did a while back. So if you go to YouTube and that's a link there, I'll include that in the description of the show um, when I update the show notes after the show. And uh, you'll be able to link through to that one. Or you can just find Mechanum Robot. And it'll be that nice uh, robot there, which is our this one here looking all nice. Okay. So if you've not already joined our Discord server, you might want to consider um, heading over to kevrobots.com slash Discord. There's a bit of a theme here with kevrobots. That's where all the, uh, the good stuff is. Uh, if you sign up there, you get a link and then you can join our Discord server. And I'll be uh, talking to people in Discord over Christmas as well. And if you're not following me on social media, I'm on all the different places. So on TikTok, I'm Kevin McAleer 6 On Instagram, I'm just Kevin McAleer. On Twitter, I'm on uh, kevsmac. And on Mastodon, I'm kevsmac at mastodon.social. Uh, and I post to all those different places as well throughout the week. And uh, if you want to help support the show, uh, you can do that. You can get your name in the credits as well by doing a super thanks. So let me switch on stream elements so that that uh, kicks in now. And you can also go over to kevsrobots.com slash coffee if you want to buy me a coffee. And some people have been amazingly awesome this past month and they bought several coffees. We'll, we'll call those people out in a second. And of course, if you want to to join the YouTube membership program, you can do that as well. Uh, there's a little join button after you've subscribed that appears. You can click that and I think it's about the price of a coffee per month uh, to help support the show. And you get your name in the credits as well, which is the, the main thing for you guys. Oops. We're going to have a look at this in a minute. Hang on. Sheesh. Right, let me just go back over to uh, the keynote, which is that one there. Cool, cool. So, yes, our supporters... So I've swapped it around now, so I'm in the middle and not uh, having to sort of squish to one side. So here are our, our supporters. So you can see the people on the left-hand side here. These are the people who bought coffees um, from buymeacoffee.com. So we've got Shroomy, we've got Derek, we've got RGS who bought five coffees, which is insane. Thank you so much for that. That's going to really help, um, so, uh, help me buy some more stuff for robots in the next year. Uh, we've got um, Maker Schultz as well, who bought uh, three coffees. Thank you so much for that. Uh, we had Bill Bernard who bought five coffees, another awesome person there. We've got Alex, we've got Simon. Simon bought three coffees, thank you so much for that. Uh, we've got A. McIntyre, we've got David Cousins, and we've got someone who wanted to be anonymous, they bought coffee as well. We've got the four members who've been uh, long-term members of the show. We've got Keith, we've got uh, Shemi, we've got uh, Steve Phillips and Thomas Weiser. Did I say that, Alex? Did I say that right? Shemi? Yeah. Yep. <laughs> I always have to make sure I get that right. And then, of course, our YouTube members. So we have uh, Hybrid Robotics, who just rejoined recently. Thanks for that, Dale. We've got uh, Hans from Cheerlights. We have Michael. We have Fraser. We have Bill. We've got uh, Jose. We've got Jeff, Johan, uh, John Paul, and, of course, Tom as well. So thank you so much for supporting the show. And if you want to join the, the Robot Overlord army, then what you need to do... Oops. <laughs> what you need to do is go over to kezrobots.com slash credits to get your name in the credits. Uh, so that's how you can do that okay so is there anything else I need to cover off there I wanted to quickly show you something just before you go then and it's just how I use Fusion 360 um, to to design some of the robots I just wanted to show you three very quick examples of that we'll not spend a lot of time on that uh, but here we go so I have um, this is the BurgerBot robot that I designed a while back so this does not use the Omni chassis. It uses its own chassis and you can see there it's got two wheels and it has these sort of uh, stub things that uh, stick out because I didn't want to have to find and buy lots of uh, caster wheels. Um, so this is a really easy way of sort of cheating that. It's designed to be like a desktop robot so it doesn't need to have like a hard wearing um, caster wheel or anything like that. The main thing that it was to do was to make a robot that can draw. So you can see there there's a little mechanism. We've got a servo. If I spin this round like so. You can see there there's a servo and there is a, a little toothed mechanism. I'm not sure I put that robot actually. He was uh, around a while ago. Probably put it back now. I'm sure I had it to hand actually. Never mind. 
Um, so yes, that one has um, a pen that can move up and down with that nice little sort of toothed mechanism. Really, really satisfying. That has the Gallium battery. It runs off a of Raspberry Pi Pico. Has the LiPo Amigo Pro as well in there for sort of power management. And um, in fact, um, Rory took this design and he built on it. So he decided to make, instead of a 3D printing it, which takes a very long time, particularly in education, if you wanted to build 30 of these, that would take quite a while. So he decided to to use this design uh, as an inspiration and build a burger bot that's a uh, laser cut so the laser cut using i think some um, mdf and that means that they can build lots of these robots very quickly for their students so they can have a uh, if not one each one between two so that's the burger bot that's um one of the later creations we've then got the uh um sonic robot I originally got to call it the radar robot, but this is the Fusion 360 design of all the different parts. So again, we start with the Omni chassis, which is just uh, this piece just here. Um, I've got the power pack, which is a, a piece that can connect up. It's got the captive nuts and uh, there's quite a complicated module. Actually, if I spin this one around here um, and then up here, so we've got like a pocket for the Gallium battery to go in. And then we've got two sort of recessed pieces here, one there and one there, with the areas for the, the header pins to be able to go through. And that's for these um, motor drivers at the back. So, And then on top we have, uh, we've got a Pimeroni um, LCD SPI display, the 1.3 display. And that's just on the back there. Um, and then we've got this sort of turret piece. So I think I had version of this previous version of this just here to hand and uh, essentially like a servo sits in here with this little uh, thing a little spindle poking out and then we can put another piece on top there that can then hold the range finder and it has a little space there for the servo horn uh, so if we remove the uh, which piece shall I remove there let's go for the base there you go you can see that we've got in fact there's a motor holder there that shouldn't be there let's just turn that off there we go so you can see there that the the servo sort of pokes through that piece there it also sticks ever so slightly out of the bottom so if i show you that there the servo ever so slightly sticks out of the bottom um but it's perfectly designed uh, height wise to be the minimum height it needs to be so that the printing time is is a as, as quick as it can be and it's this has got three captive nuts it's got two that you can see there and there's like another one which is hidden away inside if i remove the chassis you can just see that thank you jacob for subscribing to the channel really appreciate that yeah you can just see just inside there there's a, another sort of inward facing captive nut piece there as well so yes that's the uh, oops i'll just uh, put that back on the base that's the piece there and there we go and sometimes, I'm not sure if I've done it on this one. No, I've not done it on this one, but I can show you on another robot. Um, I join these pieces together and have pivot points so I can actually articulate it and check that all the things work the way I expect them to from a sort of mechanical point of view. So let's just spin that one back round. I think that's the view that we normally have. Um, so that's the uh, Sonic, and then we have the... Um, explore robot so this one you can see that i've even modeled in the battery that very same battery that we've got uh, working at the moment we've got the raspberry pi zero there we've got the explorer hat this one has like an extra layer uh, which is this sort of white piece here and again the, the idea here is we've got we've got stacks of layers and um, it means that we can then house this on the top out of the way and a reasonably high up on the robot so it's it's still quite stable um because it's got quite a wide base the height of it, um, I think the height is probably about the width of the, the, the base as well. So um, it's got quite a solid foundation for that to sit on there. Um, so that works quite well. And they all use the um, the same Omni chassis there. Okay, so that's um, that one. Did I show you that last one, which is the Rover, which we've been looking at today. Um, when I actually designed this, the Motor 2040 was a was a hush hush top secret project, so I couldn't actually include any information about that. But obviously, that's now been released, so you can buy these. These are a really great board uh, from Pimeroni. So there we go. We can uh, see how all that fits together. I've modelled all the different parts out so that we can check all the different um, components fit together. I even had to model out the the um, 
the wheels, the mechanism wheels, that, that was quite fun putting that together because they're not um, like a linear shape. These, these have a thin bit, a wide bit and another thin bit. So I had to do all kinds of clever lofts and so on for that. Okay, I can see there's a couple of questions coming through there. So I think this is probably a good time to say, if you're watching this on replay, this is the point in the video where I'm going to cut uh, and uh, you're going to miss out all the live stuff, all the Q&A after the, uh, the show. It's been quite a long show today, so I really appreciate you sticking with me and I shall see you all next time. So thanks for watching.